Well, all right, dear friends, just continuing and building on what Pastor Peters and what John Holler shared, I want to continue forward based on some of the things that each of them highlighted. Let's begin in 2 Timothy, please. Chapter 1, verses 13, verse 13, I'm sorry, verse 15. 2 Timothy 1, 15. You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Vigilis and Homogenes. Okay, they turned away. Okay. Let's go to chapter 2. Verse 19, their talk will spread like gangrene, strong language, leaving death, dead tissue, necrosis to the body of Christ. That's strong language. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 17, their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Phygelus, Homogenes. Now Hymenaeus and Philetus. Chapter 4, verse 9. Make every effort to come to me. Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. Demas. Verse 14 of chapter 4, Alexander the coppersmith didn't mean much harm. Oh, Paul, he just slags everybody off. <laughs> he thinks he's the only one that's right. He just goes around slagging people off. <laughs> Sound familiar? He warned the church who they were. He warned the church what they did. He warned the church about what they were teaching. And he described it as necrosis, gangrenous. Gangrene causes amputations. Major portions of the body of Christ would require amputation or it would kill the body. If you let the you know, if a severe diabetic steps on a rusty nail, they better get they better get to medical help really quickly, really quickly. Gangrene. These things are gangrene, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the apostles had no qualms using that language to describe them. And no qualms about naming them publicly. And the Holy Spirit had no qualms about inspiring them to write it eternally in the Word of God. I've heard this 15,000 times. We'll just teach the truth. We'll let the Lord deal with the error. I've heard this 16,000 times. There's no need to name the names. <laughs> the Holy Spirit made a mistake or did Paul make a mistake? Is the word of God right or are you right? But there's people who say that. There's pastors who say that. They say, we have to be loving and gracious. Now understand something about the people who John was talking about and the kind of situations John Peters made reference to. Look with me, please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2.
verses 10 and 11, with all deception of wickedness, those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence that they may believe what is false. In its context, this is not only or even necessarily, primarily speaking about unsaved people. It's he who perseveres to the end shall be saved. It's warning believers. But then he goes on. He says it's not going to happen until the apostasy comes first in verse 3. St. Paul, using the same word, 1 Timothy 4, the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will apostatize, fall away. Same word in Greek. Falling away. We interpret Scripture in light of Scripture. In Timothy 4, he's writing about the same thing he's writing about in 2 Thessalonians, using the same word. Text, context, co-text. There would be no reasonable way to conclude anything other than he's talking about people who once professed to believe the truth, abandoning it. Apostatizing. You cannot apostatize from something you never believed. Now, we've warned about this before, and we've explained it, a misuse of the Greek word aphistiamai, an underlying term that does not even occur in Scripture, but it is a etymologically root term in the Greek having the same root as apostatize. Because John Wolver, Dr. John Wolver, president of Dallas Seminary, admitted in his book on the rapture, that there is no passage that teaches a pre-trib rapture. And he was pre-trib. Or because John MacArthur said there's no passage or verse that teaches it, he said it's between the lines. Those are exact words. They had a problem. Where is it? Oh, it's implied. People can imply anything. Ultra-Calvinists, not the Tulip Calvinists, the John Calvin Calvinists, the original ones, they believe in covenant theology. We think of Calvinism as Bezos Tulip from the Remonstrance of Dort. That was not the original Calvinism. That came later. The original Calvinism of John Calvin was covenant theology. God only ever made two covenants, not the old and the new, but one with Adam and one with Abraham. You ask them, where is this? Oh, it's implied. They build their whole doctrinal theology on something not in there by saying it's implied. Wait a minute. When God wants to state something dogmatically, he doesn't imply it. He states it straight out. All you're voicing is an opinion. You're making a doctrine out of an opinion. Now, we've explained this before. Well, we have people today, people who have always liked some of them, you have Paul Wilkinson in this country, who's done a lot of good things I agree with. He's done good things I've agreed with. And Thomas Ice in the United States, who's done good things I agree with. Saying that the apostasy is the rapture, because it means an underlying term, apostasy, can mean a spatial departure. <laughs> This is not traditional pre-tribulationism, you understand. 
The original pre-trib people didn't believe such things. <coughs> what they're teaching now, that the rapture is going to herald a great revival. No, it's not. It says in the book of Revelation, men still would not re <laughs> repent of their evil deeds. But let's look at the nature of the apostasy. These people teaching these things are people who at one time at least professed to believe the truth. John Haller put emphasis on uh, Charles Stanley's son, Andrew St Andy Stanley. The basis of the historicity of the resurrection is the New Testament. It's scripture. He's saying our faith is based on the resurrection. Yeah, but the historicity of the resurrection depends on scripture. The Ten Commandments at Acts 15, the apostle said, we don't have to subscribe to the Ten Commandments. What does he do with the fact that nine of the Ten Commandments are reiterated as being for believers in the New Testament? Yes, but we can lie now, we can murder now, we can commit adultery now, we can covet now. Nine of the Ten Commandments are reiterated in the New Testament. Nine of the Ten. The only one that's not reiterated is the Sabbath, and, and that's also taught, but it's not, it's taught as being fulfilled in a person, not in a day. But all of it reiterated in the New Testament. He's either an idiot or a liar. You understand? Now, I don't think he's a comp nobody can be that stupid. You, want the <laughs> okay. you may have a point. But I'll tell you who is the, the people who will believe it. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. A verse we've often pointed to. Verse 6. Paul's writing to a church that is predominantly Gentile, although it did have Jews in it. Now these things happened as examples for us. He says... He reiterates this. The Old Testament, these things were put there for our instruction. According to Paul, the history of Israel is there to teach us. Andy Stanley denies this. Open apostasy. You understand? And his father lets him do it. His father was on TBN. There were issues with his father anyway. Marital and otherwise, it became very public. But I love Christians who recognize the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. But the apex of that is their salvation as Beryl pointed out, this dual covenant theology, this is apostasy. It's the power of salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first. There is salvation in no other name. He also is divorced, by the way, and remarried. Very often when you see people with wrong doctrine, you see things wrong in their lives morally. Very often. One can be symptomatic of the other. Let's look. Rob Bell. That This is from 2,000 years ago. And the church will be finished if we apply things... What about the word of the Lord endures forever? Heaven and earth shall pass away. 
My word shall never pass away. The man is an out and out liar of Satan. Rick Warren. Another one. We have to align ourselves with people who worship other gods to bring in worldwide peace. Avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion. But Jesus said, be watchful, be alert. No, no. Forget about Jesus. Listen to me. Forget about the New Testament. Read the purpose driven lie. There was another book called The God Chasers, in which the epistles were demeaned as dusty old letters. The churches two millennia ago. That's where God used to be. We have to go to where God is now. Gerald Coates in this country, remember the insufficiency of Scripture? Most of the restorationists, the people who were caught up in the apostles and prophets and Latter-day Reign thing in this country, most of them, Gerald Coates, Bryn Jones, Roger Foster, Terry Virgo, they were all from the brethren. It's not like they didn't know the truth. I don't mean the exclusive brethren. They were from the mainstream brethren. They knew the truth. They apostatized. They apostatized. And we're seeing more and more apostasy. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, I have pointed out several times that a generation ago, when Christians used the metaphor or the colloquialism of Babylon, it was understood in popular Christian nomenclature. You were speaking about the Roman Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, the World Council of Churches, or a cult like the Jehovah's Witnesses or something like that, or the Mormons. It was understood. That's Babylon. That's the false church. Now Babylon is Elam. Now Babylon is the Restoration Movement. Now Babylon is Bethel from Redding, California, Bill Johnson. Now Babylon is Hillsong. Now Babylon is apostasy among people who at one time professed to believe the gospel and the scriptures. This is apostasy. We have seen the apostasy of entire denominations that have had an evangelical heritage, the Methodists among them, Baptist Union not far in back of them, Church of England goes without saying, mainstream Pentecostalism, forget it. The traditional assemblies of God in Elam no longer exist. Different people may have taken the property, deeds to the property. <laughs> they may have taken the name, but they don't have the same beliefs as the founders of Pentecostalism. Baptists few have the same beliefs as Charles Spurgeon or uh, John Bunyan or William Carey. Methodists the same with John Wesley and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield. They're all the same. They're all pretty much the same. Now we've seen the apostasy of whole denominations. And we see that those who apostatize are opposed to those who hold on to the truth. Where we are told to mark a factious man, what they don't tell you there is the word is heresis. <laughs> Dicostasia with his dichotomy. It's the ones who depart from New Testament truth who are divisive. But of course, if you don't want to divert with them, they call you divisive. 
This is unbelievable. Not that it's happened, but the speed at which it's happened. It is very much like the book of Kings and Chronicles. One generation made the difference. One generation. Doesn't matter how much good was done by a king like Hezekiah or Josiah. Doesn't matter how much good was done within one generation. King Asa, within one generation, groaned. As the late Chuck Smith used to say, every generation has to have its own revival. You can only run on the inertia of previous revivals for so long. And he was right. No, when you run on inertia, you eventually run out of energy. It gets slower and slower and slower. Then you have to subscribe to a fantasy. <laughs> In this fantasy, it's what Paul says would happen. Holding the form of religion, but denying the power therein. There's no power. The first thing we're told, the dunamis, the power, is the power unto salvation. You heard that heretic? He was saying, you don't even have to believe in the historicity of Jesus. Just follow what Jesus that never existed and your life will change. That's what he said. <laughs> Deny the power of salvation. Holding the form but denying the power therein. That's all it is. Empty shell. Nothing in it. Nothing. So, how do we understand this? Remember, Israel's history was written that we would not repeat the same mistakes. 1 Corinthians 10, Romans 15 tells us we should also learn from the things that Israel did that were right. Whatever was written in former times in Romans 15 was written for our instruction. Now that verse alone is categorically rejected by Andy Stanley. Whatever was written in the Old Testament was written for our, he just rejects that. We had this guy, who, he's, he got by Bill Randalls, he got by Dave Royal, then he got by me up to a point from South Africa. He would teach crazy things and then say, you don't understand it because you're a Gentile. The, the people in churches. We made a response showing that he was contradicting Louis Goldberg, <laughs> Alfred Edemsheim, Arthur, uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, we, David Barron. We showed all of the Jewish scholars, historians, and theologians who he was contradicting. <laughs> He's an apostate. Well, imagine saying, imagine saying, God the Father is not the creator. God the Father never created anything. And he cites four verses in the New Testament that he says proves it was created by Jesus independent of the Father. Well, in the Greek original, He's using archaic translations of the scripture to English. Three of those verses use the preposition. They were created through Jesus, not by him. And one, he created in him. In him. The scripture doesn't say what he says it says. He's unable to respond to this. We read Proverbs 8, we see Jesus as the co-creator, the Father creating through Jesus, or through the Son, it wasn't called Jesus then, the Logos, the eternal Son of God. The Father made the world through the Son. In Genesis, in the, crea in the creation, we see all three persons of the Godhead involved, don't we? 
in the Greek Septuagint of Genesis 1, it opens the same way as the Gospel of John, NRK, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Logos. Okay. So we see the Father and the Son working in harmony. The Father has created the Son as the agent of creation, as it were the co-creator through whom he did it. We cannot base doctrines on church tradition, on credos or creeds of the church that come from church councils. Although the Athanasian creed says true things, It's not a basis of doctrine. That the Holy Spirit is God and the Creator, well, the Spirit moved on the face of the water. All three persons are involved in the creation. In John, born of the water and the Spirit, all three persons are involved in the new creation. All three persons of the Trinity or the Triunity are involved in the creation. All three are involved in the new creation. So you got the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed. These are credos. They come from something called the line of faith, but they are patristic. They come from the church fathers. They may say true things, but they're not the basis of doctrine because they're patristic, not apostolic. But we have the Apostles' Creed. Before the New Testament was written and copies of it were widely available all over the place, there was the line of faith that came from the Apostles. It opens like this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That was the teaching of the apostles. That's not the Athanasian Creed or the Nicene Creed. It is not patristic. It is apostolic. So you have somebody who denies it. Teaches. God the Father never created anything. And of course, when I say this is heresy, he's defended. The person who defends him will not deal with the issue, does not even deal with the doctrine. It's just totally ad hominem. He attacked me and those who agree with me for having confronted this heretical false teacher. Didn't deal with the issue. Now, what do you do when he heads an organization that you always supported and endorsed? I was a close friend of Stuart Duell. I grieved at his funeral up in Darlington. I prayed for the future of that organization, Intercessors for Britain. I had a high regard for Ray Belays and a very high regard for David Clark. That organization has done much good in many ways. If there's one thing Britain needs, it's intercessory prayer. But one generation makes the difference. What do you do when the new director? Look how many good kings of Israel had bad sons. What do you do when Ray Belay's son, Dave, defends somebody who says God the Father never created anything and he's not the creator and defends it. And he says, you're bad for challenging it. This is apostasy, you understand? These churches were good at one time. These ministries were good at one time. But they've fallen like dominoes, one after another. And it's not getting better. It's going to get worse. You understand at different times, I've attended, I've been members of Baptist churches, of Assemblies of God churches, of Elam churches. I've been members of these things. I can't think of any ministry that I sanctioned more than Intercessors for Britain. I can't think of any, Stuart Dool was my friend. He used to come to hear me speak. 
Still remember sitting at his funeral. It's terrible. How one generation can make a difference. Just like the book of Kings. Just like the book of Chronicles. How quick apostasy can set in. How rapidly much good can be laid to waste. And then when you have the Ellie effect, where the fathers won't correct their sons, that catalyzes it. That catalyzes it. So how are we to understand this? Israel, prophecy, and you. These things were written for our instruction. Whether Andy Stanley likes it or not, no matter how much his father Charles, who at one time had been a good preacher, I once, as a young Christian, watched the 16 millimeter films before videos even, of his father speaking at a prayer conference in Texas, and he gave the best teaching on prayer that I had ever heard up until that time. This is the father now. This is the father. Well, it goes on. Why was the Old Testament written? Verse 4 of Corinthians of Romans 15. Whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. So that through perseverance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. When you look at God's faithful dealing with Israel, that is the source of our hope. It was written for us, not just for Israel. It says it directly. But this heretic says it isn't. Well, let's see what was written for our instruction. And let's see if it gives us any hope. Turn with me, please, to Yermiyahu Hanavi, the book of Jeremiah, the eighth chapter. Verse 1, at that time, declares the Lord. 8, Jeremiah 8. At that time, declares the Lord, they will bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of its princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem from their graves. They'll spread them out to the sun and moon and to all the hosts of heaven, which they've loved and which they've served and which they have gone after and which they have sought and which they have worshipped. Necromancy and astrology. You look at this stuff, Insanity. The blood moons. <laughs> that thing from September 22nd, it's Revelation 12, those lunatics. They're looking at the stars. Now, for prophetic revelation. Now there are figurative meanings of, of celestial bodies in Scripture, typologically, that's one thing. But these people used it predictively. 
And then they get the bones of the dead. I am telling you, they are doing this. They're doing it in Wales. They're doing it in America. Grave soaking. It began with Benny Hinn saying the ghost of Catherine Coleman was appearing to him. And Amy McPherson, Catherine Coleman, whatever you make of her, she ran off with another woman's husband. Then she repented, but if she repented, she wouldn't be back in the ministry. Then there was Earl Park, who's now dead, who said there are Christian seances for him to talk to his deceased sister. But then they get into grave soaking. They're literally going to cemeteries, laying down on the ground. And they take one verse out of all context from the Old Testament that had nothing to do with grave soaking. And they're doing it. They're going to the corpses of the dead. I've seen a lot of dead bodies. I've seen dissected corpses. I've seen <laughs> there's nothing holy about them. Talk to somebody in the medical profession or the funeral industry. There's nothing holy or anointed or powerful about the stiff. <laughs> the only thing is you can trust them. You can turn your back on them. <laughs> you can tell them anything and they keep their mouth shut. <laughs> but they can't do anything for you. Grave soaking. And off the var hadash, tachat shemesh. There's nothing new under the sun. These igno ignorant people think it's new. Oh, my Lord. They will not be gathered or buried. They will be as dung on the face of the ground. Death will be chosen rather than life by all the remnant that remains of this evil family that remains in all the places I have driven them, declares the Lord of hosts. The Lord said, you want to go to the dead, you're going to be dead. Now, don't get me wrong, I do believe in a literal resurrection. I do believe that the corpses of Faithful Christians are going to be reconstituted. They will biologically come back to life. But in the meantime, they're dead. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Can the Lord put the atoms together, put the molecules together? Yes, and he will. But in the meantime, it's a car with no engine in it. You can hop in put the key in the ignition, but you aren't going anyplace. <laughs> They're going to the dead. So God says, I'll give you up for dead. Use a strong language in Hebrew, so I, God says, this is what you want? God calls it, calls them excrement. That's literally what it says. Excrement on the face of the earth. Strong words, but they're not my words. Let's look. Death. You want to go to the dead? You'll have death because you're choosing death over life. 
in all the places I've driven you. Where did he drive them? Into Babylon, didn't he? Jeremiah was prophesying of the Babylonian captivity. Remember, as we've taught many times, Old Testament Babylon, going all the way back to the Tower of Babel, but the Babylonian Empire. The mentions of, of Babylon as Rome in the New Testament and so forth, all of these things reach their climax in Babylon the Great. They're going to Babylon! When Rick Warren teaches in his Global Peace Plan, we must unite with people who worship other gods, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, whatever. The fact that Moses said other gods are demons, Shadim or Paul, you've heard me say, the monoid demons, doesn't matter. Rick Warren says we have to unite with them to bring in global peace. It's the Antichrist who will bring in a false peace. We'll see that in a moment. It's his Antichrist. Where are these people going? Where is Hillsong going? Where is Bethel going? Where is Elam gone to? <laughs> Babylon the Great. These things are written for our instruction. What does it say in Romans 11? He didn't spare the natural branches. The Jews went to Babylon. His own people went to Babylon because of what you're doing. If he didn't spare the natural branches, you know he's not going to spare you. Verse 4, you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, do men fall and not get up again? Does one turn away and not repeat? Or, sorry, turn away and not repent? There's no repentance. Teshuvah, returning to God in the Hebrew text. Why then has this people, Jerusalem, turned away in continual apostasy. What does Paul say in Timothy? Apostasy. What does Paul say in 2 Thessalonians? Apostasy. The apostate church will wind up in Babylon. They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. Whenever you nail these guys, they always say, I was misunderstood, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> yeah, play the videos and watch it. It's all deceit. Sometimes the deception is unbelievable. Bill Randalls was here, and in order to defend somebody who says God the Father is not the creator, and somebody who taught that animal blood will make propitiation in the millennium, and the blood of Jesus will not be eternally efficacious, they showed a question and answer time from Bill Randall's church that was edited. And when you look at the unedited version, I tried to speak and a challenge, but the pastor appropriately did it instead of me. It was his church. Bill Randall spoke out. When you watch the unedited version, it's the diametric opposite of what GV 24-7 and Deb Menlos and these people were actually putting in the public domain. An open lie? To deceive Christians? They actually put up an edited video. Bill Randall's nearly hit the roof. 
That's not what happened. You can pray the power of God into fabric, the anointing. That's what Paul did. No, it doesn't. It's accusative case. Paul did nothing. God did it. It would have been nominative case if Paul did it. But Paul did it so we can do it. First of all, Paul didn't do it. That you can pray the power of God into a jacket or into a cloth and knock people down, you know, the Benny Hinn stuff. Then he says, oh, I didn't mean that that was from 2009. I don't believe it anymore. Well, 2009 is 15 years after you supposedly left the word faith. So you still believed it 15 years later if you were telling the truth. But you're not telling the truth. The internet shows you posted it in June of this year, 2018. Why did you lie? Why did GV 24-7? It's, it's all deceit. They've got no problem deceiving Christians. No problem. They refuse to repent. Now, the word repent, teshuvah, has the idea of return, refuse to return. Teshuvah, repent means to turn back to God. I've listened and heard. They've spoken what is not right. No man has repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? I didn't do anything wrong. I'm the victim. You're picking on me. That's what they do. When they get nailed, when they get indicted by their own words, they play the victim. They emotionally play on people's sympathies. This is particularly true of what Paul called, and I don't mean this in a sexist way, silly women. Weak-willed women who are emotionally manipulated thinking with their emotions instead of their brains, imagining it to be the Holy Spirit. Oh, he's a nice Jewish boy. So was Judas. <laughs> the serpent beguiles the woman. Of course, it's not only women who get deceived by it. It's men who wear girls' knickers under their trousers. Most unfortunate, but this is the reality. Let's look. Everyone turned to his course like a horse charging into the battle. Even the stork in the sky knows her seasons, and the turtle dove and the swift and the thrush Observe the time of their migration. But my people do not know the ordinance of the Lord. You shall not bear false witness. Televising or webcasting edited videos to mislead people to the detriment of somebody telling the truth. But I don't care about that. I'm used to it. What bothers me is they deceive the church. Hey, you want to throw a rock at me? Welcome to the club. They don't know the ordinance of the Lord. This is unbelievable. The ordinance of the Lord. They're saying an animal has more sense. An animal has more sense. When you've got a guy like Steve Chalk demanding the church 
perform same-sex marriages among evangelicals. You do not have penetrated same-sex relationships in the animal kingdom in any vertebr other vertebrae, phylum chordata, if I remember my zoology well. You know, what, an animal has more sense! These people reduce themselves to a mentality that is not only subhuman, it's subanimalistic. Same sex marriage in evangelical churches? Cliff Richards has called for that too. I wonder why. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? They still pretend to be scriptural. We still have a belief in the Torah. Yeah. But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The lying pen of the scribes. The purpose-driven lie. Love wins. The God chasers. Eugene Peterson's The Message. Jesus Calling. The Shack. The lying pen of the scribes. They pretend to be scriptural, but their books are the lying pen of the scribes. This stuff is not new. It happened to Judah. It happened to Israel. These things are written for our instruction. Well, look what happened to them as a result. Look what happened to them as a consequence of such actions and false beliefs and following such corrupt leaders. That is what will happen to the church. If he didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. September, the thing with Revelation 12 with the stars is how Jeremiah begins. Trying to get the anointing off the corpses of the dead. Now they got the grave soaking. Jeremiah's, they're doing it now. The lying pen of the scribes. That's what it is. It's the lying pen of the scribes. But let's continue. The wise men are put to shame in verse 9. They're dismayed and caught. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. What kind of wisdom do they have? That the blood of animals can atone for sin or to make propitiation? Revelation says the gospel is eternal. The angel preached the eternal gospel, doesn't it? Oh no, that's going to end! The blood of Jesus won't cleanse from sin anymore. Hey, but it says it's eternal. Oh no! I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven. And oh no, we never created anything. Yeah. 
and it's defended by intercessors for Britain? A ministry like that is defended by an organization that that never did anything in this country but good, that never did anything but uphold truth and righteousness. This is called apostasy. Look what it says. They get dismayed when they get caught. When somebody calls them out and they get nailed, what's the problem? (laughs) What did I say? Oh, you misunderstood him. No, I didn't. It's what you said. It's what you wrote. Then it goes on. Therefore, I will give their wives to others, their fields to new owners, because from the least even to the greatest. Everyone is greedy for gain. God will take away what they have, their marriages, their possessions, their mission field. He will take it away. Why? Let no one deceive you. Where you see false prophets... P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. <coughs> it's not about the prophet. It's about the P-R-O-F-I-T. They're in it for money. At some level, they're in it for money. Imagine making an evangelistic film and saying, doing this for the Lord to reach souls. I said, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do this. The unsaved actors are paid. They're talented to pay. The believers know that you've got to do it for the Lord. Okay. But then it gets sold to the world. I asked GV 24-7 and, and Bethel, the, the woman's thing, Do you agree that God the Father is not the creator? So you're a heretic too? You think he's not the creator? Well, then why are you promoting the ministry of somebody who does and charging people 30 pounds to come hear him? It's about money! Because I spoke out of this stuff, I was denounced. I was called every kind of villain you can imagine. Okay. Intercessors for Britain attacked me, studios, okay. But then why are you selling films that feature me? If I am one-tenth the nefarious villain you're telling people on social media, why are you still selling the films? It makes no logical sense. It makes no theological sense. It only makes, if it sells, will do it. Well, you see false doctrine, and when you see false prophecy, somewhere there is a financial motive. It's financially motivated. It's inevitable. The real God shows his head. His name is Mammon. They'll deny it. Oh, we don't do it for money. (laughs) Then why are you selling it? I wouldn't sell Kenneth Copeland videos or Benny Hinn videos or Joyce Meyer video. I wouldn't sell films to those people. How could I be denouncing somebody and sell films featuring them? They'll sell anything to anybody. Everyone's greedy for gain. From the prophet to the priest, corrupt clergy, everyone practices deceit. This is what happened. 
before the Babylonian captivity. It's what happened in the days of Jeremiah, and it's what's happening today. Let's continue. They heal the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially. <coughs> Saying, peace, peace. But there is no peace. What does the New Testament say about this? Speaking of the second coming of Jesus in 1 Thessalonians 5, look with me please to 1 Thessalonians 5 <coughs> and see how Paul cites and interprets this verse for believers, for the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Verse 1, now as to the times and epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them. Straight out of the Septuagint version of Jeremiah, chapter 8, almost word for word. Peace, peace, there is none. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they'd done? They certainly were not. These people have no sense of ignominy for their actions. They did not know how to blush. If it sells, it sells. Therefore, they shall be among those who fall. At the time of their punishment, they shall be brought down, says the Lord. Not says Jacob, not says John Holler, not says John Peters, not says anybody, saith the Lord. It goes on and on and on. Verse 15, we waited for peace, but no good came. For time of healing, but behold, terror. It goes on. Verse 20, theme verse of my upcoming book. Harvest is past. Summer is ended. We are not saved. For the brokenness of the door of my people, I'm broken. I mourn. I dismay. Dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? No, there is no bomb in Gilead. And those who go this route will be like the foolish virgins of Matthew 25. The Lord will have come and gone. They'll be like the sleeping bride in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5. When she knocks in desperation, it's because when he knocked, she didn't want to open the door. He came and he went. Yeah. That's what happened to Israel. That's what happened to Judah. And that's what's going to happen to the apostate church.
There's much to be said about this. My upcoming book will deal with this subject and how God's purposes for Israel will then come into play again once the church is removed. As you continue reading, there was plots against Jeremiah. Plots! Those who uphold the truth, there will be plots against them. I don't mean by the world. I mean by the apostate church. You see him? Methodist preacher, they plotted against him. You see John Holler? He grew up in Grace Brethren. They plotted against him. They always do that. They always have. They always will. Well, let them soak on their graves and look at the stars. Let them lie. Let them adhere to the lying pen of the scribes. We know the outcome. We know what's going to happen to them. But by the grace of Jesus, if we remain faithful to him on the basis of his word, I guarantee you, no matter what transpires in this temporal world, what happens to them will not happen to us. God bless.